I think there's no question that if you have a baby that is more irritable and, um, d well, we could say, qu in quotation marks, more needy, um, during the first few months of life, you are going to establish a pattern where you feel and you have ju justification for that, there's a need for you to be more interventive. So some of these kids um, don't sleep unless you carry them around on you or... Yeah, or turn purple. Or, you know, you take them for long walks or put them in the car or put them on the dryer or whatever you have to do to get them to go to sleep. Um, and so there's a lot of intervention that's associated with that. But we know that crying peaks by about three months of age. And we also know that um, there's that period that they call, that Ron Barr's nickname, purple crying, that happens from about six weeks to about three months, and that's when it peaks. So the, the tricky part for those mums is to go with the developmental changes in the infant and figure out how to change those rather vigilant behaviors so that they're not ending up being intrusive behaviors for the five or six month old who's moving on to a place where they need opportunities to develop, sorry, more self-regulation and um, more opportunities to self-regulate. And the mom's so into the established pattern that she can't kind of create the space for that. So that's where I would say there ends up being a, a little bit of a disconnect there. Yeah. Okay. So what, why are these, why am, am I arguing this is a public health issue? Well, we've already talked about this notion that these sl short sleep trajectories persist from infancy to beyond infancy. And the longitudinal study I talked about before that was done by Touchette and Al in Quebec um, showed that 20 three, or well, 24% of infants did not sleep six consecutive hours at five months of age. So that's a pretty big group. That's almost a quarter. Of those infants, 17.8%, so that's almost 18%, were sleeping fewer than six consecutive hours at 17 months. So that was persisting to 17 months. And of the 17-month-olds, 33% were sleeping fewer than six consecutive hours at 29 months. So we've got a subset of kids who do not grow out of this problem, and it persists, and it persists right into school age. So when they study these children from five months to six years, children who were sleeping less than six consecutive hours at night at five months, as I've said previously, represented the highest, persistent, the highest percentage of short sleepers at six years of age, and that's 32%. So this shorter sleep periods at night and overweight obesity, now we've had studies in Japan, China, Germany, Australia, no, not Australia, Japan, China, Germany, Canada, and the US. So it's not only, we're not only seeing this association in one country. And these are big studies. These, um, some of them have 1,500 kids, some of them have 6,000 kids. They're not small sample sizes. And they are controlling for everything known to mankind. So they are controlling for a mother's pre-pregnancy weight, whether the mother smoked during pregnancy, what the baby's birth weight was, whether the kids are watching, uh, how many hours of TV they're watching, whether they're involved in active play, whether they got complimentary feeding early on, whether they're eating more snacks while they're watching TV. I mean, you name it, they're controlling for it. So they're trying to dis de determine whether this short sleep trajectory is associated with obesity in these kids while controlling for all these other variables that they know are associated with obesity. And they're not just looking at BMI, because I know BMI has come under some criticism. They're also looking at skin folds. So they're looking at triceps and scapular skin folds. And they're also looking at BIA, which is, wait for it, um, bioelectrical impedance analysis. And that's when they actually put electrodes on somebody and they can figure out what proportion of their body mass is fat. Who knew? Okay, so, um, so they're doing this and in the German study, and it had 6,800 6, kids in it that were five to six years old, they were showing a dose response with sleep and obesity. So kids who had less than 10 hours of sleep had an obesity prevalence of 5.4%. If they got between 10 and a half and 11 hours, the prevalence was 2.8%. And over 11 hours, it dropped to 2.1%. So it 
So that was controlling for all those other variables that influence obesity. So really, half the rate of obesity in the long sleep trajectory kids compared to the short sleep trajectory kids. Um, and then there was half the risk of being obese, yeah, at, with over 11 hours of sleep a night. And I've already said all the things they control for. Then there was an American longitudinal study of um, 915 children, and she looked at baby sleep at six months, one year, and two years of age. She measured height and weight at one, two, and three, and then she also measured skin folds at three years of age, subscapular and triceps. And they defined overweight as a BMI of more than 95 percent, on the more than 95th percentile, and risk of overweight with a BMI of between the 85th and the 95th percentile. So that's up there in terms of how they were defining it. And they controlled for um, age, sex, maternal education, income, pre-pregnancy, BMI, marital status, pre prenatal smoking history, breastfeeding duration, ethnicity, birth weight, weight for length at six months. They also controlled for average TV or video viewing and active play. So they, they could only control for all that because they had a massive sample size. But anyway, the children who slept less than 12 hours had a two-fold increase in the prevalence of being overweight, and infant sleep of less than 12 hours was associated with a high B, higher BMI, skin fold thickness, and increased odds of being overweight twice at three years of age. So this is sleep at six months predicting overweight at three years of age, which I think is important. Um, and this was minimally changed by adjusting for hours of watching TV and active play. And then there was a Chinese study of 1,300 three to four year olds and kids with less than nine hours of sleep had five times the odds of obesity of kids who um, had, well, they just had five times the odds of obesity in the sample, whereas kids who slept um, nine and, to nine and a half hours were three times, had three times higher odds of being obese. And in the Canadian study, they looked at the risk of obesity at two and a half and six years of age in 1,100 kids and they found a significant effect between overweight obesity and short sleep duration of less than nine hours with a 31% or 31 risk compared to a 24% risk. So at, at age six, the risk of being overweight was 6.2 times higher for short persistent sleep be, uh, behaviors than for kids who slept 11 hours. So I think there's enough evidence accumulating here that we need to take a look at this. And given the health risks associated with obesity and our worries about what the, the um, burden is going to be on our health care system, not to mention the effects of these kids who are now being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes when they're barely out of their childhood years, we really need to be paying attention to things that could be potentially contributing to this. And clearly, sleep is one of those things. Nobody's saying it's the only indicator, but it's clearly got the propensity to to, uh, to uh, contribute. And then there's quite a few studies that have been done in Canada and Australia that indicate a higher risk of hyperactivity for kids with short sleep trajectories. And also, I did a study um, in Australia. I think there was about 1,100 kids in the study. It was a longitudinal data set that I used in uh, Western Australia. And um, hours of sleep at three years of age, or high sleep problem scores at three years of age, predicted parental assessment of higher aggressive behavior for four-year-olds while controlling for maternal depression. And I control for maternal depression because it often coexists with sleep problems and a lot of people blame the depression when it may well be the sleep problems that are the issue. And